Well, good morning uh, and welcome to Roswell Community Church Online, also known as RCC Home Edition. Uh, my name is Matt and I am one of the pastors here. And uh, these are some pretty unprecedented times of social distancing. And um, in the midst of it, I'm pretty grateful that we can have this kind of connection digitally to be able to be together. Though I must say, I far prefer doing this face-to-face, which Lord willing, by grace and some great science, we're gonna be able to do that soon uh, again together. In the meantime, we are committed to um, keeping you updated and uh, keeping you connected and hopefully keeping you encouraged. Uh, so I want you to make sure you tune in to our RCC uh, Facebook Online Connect um, during the week, as well as our Instagram page, the the, the church app. Make sure you stay connected during the week, and I'm, I'm hoping that you are able to take advantage this morning uh, from nine um, at nine o'clock of the kids worship element that we were able to put together, uh, so that families with kids were able to do some some worshiping together. We're going to be making more kid engagement opportunities available soon, so make sure you stay tuned. Speaking of connection, what I'd love to have you do first is to take this moment and take a home worship selfie of you and whoever you're worshiping with this morning from your living room. I don't care if it's a bad hair day, if you didn't brush your teeth, nobody cares. We just want to get to see each other and to connect with each other by uh, seeing what worship looks like from home. So so take a selfie, <clears throat> get up, do it right now, take a selfie, and then post it either to Instagram or to the Facebook Connect, and let's see each other. Let's get an opportunity to connect with each other in this kind of a moment. So make that happen it's going to be great. Look forward to seeing all the captured moments of worship at RCC. Home edition. Uh, well, as we try to adjust to um, this shifting developments of corona, which seem to change by the day and the various forms of, uh, well, disruptions, right? Uh, the different kinds of quarantines that are showing up and manifesting. I thought we'd shift a sermon series um, over to the book of Philippians for a little bit of a season, uh, actually for the next several weeks. Um, so if you have a, have a Bible near you or if you have your phone, go ahead and open to Philippians chapter one. This would also be a good time if you're gonna be have an opportunity to grab some communion elements for you to go and get some juice and some, and, uh, some bread because we're gonna be taking communion together in just a few minutes. But I'm taking us to Philippians um, where the Apostle Paul, who is uh, in a quarantine of his own of sorts, uh, though his is not self-imposed so much as it is imposed by the Roman government uh, with chains on his wrists and a centurion, I mean, a, a, a guard by his side, um, we find him writing this letter. He pens this letter from change, from his cell, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit to a church that he loves. He loves the church in Philippi. And uh, this is a church that is also going through a time of, of both suffering and they're under strain. And so my hope is as we walk through some of the elements of the letter to the Philippians in the weeks to come, my prayer is that, um, that God might invite each of us to live out of the joy-filled heart that he has for us in the midst of all these trying and unknown circumstances, because I think that's some of what the, the book promises to us through the power of the Spirit. So to that end, uh, listen to the word of God from Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy or, and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that, will that, that, that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by death or by life. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet to depart, yet which I, um, 
Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in these verses, um, there's this particular picture of of internal motivation that yields to an external manifestation. Over and over, Paul has this set of internal beliefs that show up in a certain kind of external action. In essence, an internal perspective that galvanizes external courage. Now, we all know that our faith is an inside-out faith, right? As believers, we, we move out into the uncertainty of the world from a place of internal solidity, from surety. We don't look to external, external security in order to have internal stability. No, circumstances aren't what guide us. No, the Spirit of God confirming the truth about God and the truth about ourselves and the truth about the world, regardless of what it looks like, telling us what's true about that, that is, in the midst of uncertain circumstances, that is what guides us. Internal perspective leading to external manifestation. So we see three particular heart-shaping and faith-building perspectives in the days ahead that will hopefully help us both today and in, in the unfolding days to come that Paul lives in front of us on the pages of the scriptures. First internal perspective that we see from Paul is from verse uh, 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, he says. Why am I in prison? Why am I here? Why is this happening to me? Paul says to advance the gospel. This is the purpose of my change, to, to take the kingdom of God and see it move forward from where it is. And how does it show up? How does it show up in Paul? Look at verse 13. So that it has become known this is true, it's become known through the whole imperial guard and, to, guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. That's the purpose, and it's shown through the way he was living, the way he was declaring himself to be. So what's the purpose? What's one of the purposes of the coronavirus for how it's affecting you and how it's affecting the world? Paul's answer would be to advance the gospel unapologetically. And I just keep wondering, what would happen if we saw the arrival of this unwanted outbreak, this unwanted viral outbreak, and it is unwanted, what if we saw it as a means for the good news of Jesus Christ, of the redeeming love of God in Christ Jesus to, to break into places and people that it otherwise would not? That this is not so much a crisis for us to weather, as it is an opportunity for us to step into. What if that was our mentality? What if that's how we saw it? Imagine, in essence, if we believe that, that corona isn't happening to us. But what if, like Paul, we believe that, that corona is happening for us? And imagine if that perspective that, that, and those behaviors began to become contagious to those among us and those around us because that's exactly what happened with Paul. What we see in verse 14 is that his perspective and his actions led to a new set of perspective and actions for those who were watching on. Look at verse 14. And most of the brothers, Paul said, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. They have a new perspective. They become confident because of his imprisonment. There's this new confidence spreading in believers. And how is it showing up? Listen to the end of 14. Becoming more confident are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What we do in these days matters. How we adjust and how we invest during this time has impact, and not just on the people that we're going to directly be connected to, but it's going to have an impact on each other as we are of encouragement to one another, as we connect with each other, that we would let it, let it be that, that we would be much more bold in speaking 
the word without fear. And I would add not just without fear, but that we would speak the word in the midst of fear, into fear, which is, of course, rampant everywhere we look and everywhere we turn around. And so Paul is living this way and people are starting to declare the word boldly but it's from some mixed motives and there's some broken patterns of how it's showing up and you can see it here that there's this imperfection of how it's playing out and Paul has a perspective on that too. So let's look what's happening. Verse 15, he says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. You see it? He says it again. I'm here because of the defense of the gospel. I'm in prison. This is happening to me because of Jesus and for his sake. It says the former, though, they proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What's Paul's perspective on this? Look what he says in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. It doesn't matter why, Paul says. I don't care about their motives. Jesus is being shared. He's being magnified. He's being put on display. And what does that create in him? What does that produce in Paul? He says, and I, and in that I rejoice. His perspective is, you know what? I just don't care why or for what motives. I'm not getting into the purposes of why these people are preaching this way. I'm just saying it's happening. Jesus is proclaimed. Good is moving forward. The kingdom is advancing and I rejoice. His reaction is rejoicing. Not resentment, but rejoicing. I I think for us, this is not a time for us to be picking apart people's motivations for each from each other, especially, especially from believers. Whether or not people are doing things out of, out of selfish ambition or out of pride or to make themselves look better than us or they're posting something on something we wrote so that they can seem more spiritual, it doesn't matter. Paul says, let's be above that. What if we stayed above the fray during this time? What if we looked at how the gospel is moving forward, which means fighting cynicism, which means celebrating what is good. It, it means speaking words of hope and, and, and life. Let's not get embroiled in partisanship or, or speculations about motives. Paul's saying, no, be, be above that because you're looking for what is good. Instead, let's point to what is good and true and lovely and praiseworthy. Let's rejoice in the advancement of grace and love wherever we see it. And by the way, we're going to see it because of the image of God and people that belong to Jesus and people who don't. And let's be people who celebrate that, who raise that up and say, this is the manifestation of a good God who meets us in terrible circumstances. That's the story we get to tell. Bottom line, celebrate the good, fight cynicism, let God sort that out later. Also, I think some of what Paul's inviting us to is is to check our own motives for what we're saying, for what we're posting, for what we're declaring. Who are you pointing to? Why are you posting? What's the motivation underneath that? Paul's inviting us to check our motives with the Spirit to pursue his perspective on that too. But above both of these perspectives, Paul has this keystone perspective that is strewn throughout all of his letters and particularly shows up in these prison letters Keystone, hap- keystone perspective that Paul has shows up at the end of verse 18 and, and following. He says, yes, indeed, even though people are doing that, yes, indeed, I will rejoice. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and through the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Good news is on the way because of your prayers and because of the power of the Spirit of Christ. And as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed but that with full courage, so not ashamed, courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Listen, whether in life or in death. Paul's sitting in prison, not knowing, what's, is, is execution coming or is liberation coming? He doesn't know. And he's saying, all I know is I'm going to live in a way that regardless of what is coming, I'm going to honor Christ and I will not be ashamed. And then verse 21, which is maybe one of the most hallmark verses of all of Paul's epistles, he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What Paul's saying is, for me, there's only a win-win scenario. 
There, there is one perspective to be had, and that is that either I have Christ or I get Christ. It's a good story regardless. I either have him or I get him. And you can see it. He hits this spot, which is maybe so countercultural. It's certainly pushing against what we have right now. Listen to verse 23. He says, my desire, he says, is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. How precious must Jesus be to Paul? How, how vivid, how desirable must he be that he's saying, you know what? To go and be with Jesus is just better. How precious is he to you? Is it, is it, is it better? Is he that precious, that beautiful, that desirous? Desirable. There's, I don't think that there is anything that could fly more into, the, into the, the, the tension right now we have between our desire to try and maintain some form of comfort and some like, semblance of control. Both of those feel like they're slowly or rapidly sliding out of our hands. And what Paul's saying here goes totally against that cultural drift. And says, no, like, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Like, my life doesn't even belong to me any more. And of course, it shows up in his, manif- here's the manifestation of Paul. He says, it's better for me to be with Christ. I would rather go and that be true. But he says in verse 25, this is, this is how this perspective leads him to act, to manifest externally. He says, convinced of this, convinced that it's more necessary for me to remain, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Christ is so precious and so palpable that his preference is to be able to continue to help them, to serve them. Loved ones, we don't know who's going to be hit by coronas, coronavirus, right? We, nobody knows. And I don't know what kind of effects, and you don't know what kind of effects it'll have on those who do get it. And I may get it, and you may get it, someone you love may get it. But amidst all this uncertainty, what Paul's inviting you to, what God's inviting you to, what the Spirit of God is inviting you to right now is to stand and live on the bedrock reality that Jesus is your life. That you get him and that you have him. That you have him and that you get him. And so to live is Christ, to die is gain. That is the ultimate reality that we stand on right now. That is true hope. That's stability. That regardless of what suffering or strain or loss may come, that it is well with our soul right now. That it can be well for your soul. If your soul is not well, friends, if, like, if someone is, is watching this and you don't know Jesus, if you don't have that bedrock, if he is not your life, I want you to know you can have that bedrock truth for you. He can be that solid ground for you. And to the degree that we hold fast to that ultimate reality in the midst of all this chaos, all the change, all the things that are unfolding, to that degree, are we going to be able to, to freely give ourselves away as Paul is doing for the progress and joy and the faith of each other and of all the people that God gives us? One of my um, favorite sh- uh, TV shows of all times is the HBO series Band of Brothers. And uh, there's in, in, in uh, episode three, um, there's, this, there's this incredible scene, just a really powerful scene. It's, a, it's an episode that father, follows Private Blythe who, who landed on D-Day with the rest of the paratroopers and was just, he, we follow him with fear, 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 fear all the way through the entire episode. And we find him on this one particular scene at one night right before they're about to go into battle again. He's in a foxhole and he starts confessing to this pretty f- amazing um, lieutenant, Lieutenant Spears. He just confesses to him. He said, listen, when I landed on D-Day, I didn't go and try and find my group. I didn't try and fight. I just kind of hid in a ditch. And I just kind of got stuck there. I didn't, I didn't move. And it's this amazing moment. And Spears, this, this lieutenant, looks at him and he says, do you know why you didn't, you didn't get out of that ditch? Do you know why you hid in that ditch, he asks him. And Private Blythe says, because I was scared. And, and Spears leans down on a knee and he says, we're all scared. He says, you hid in that ditch because you still think there's hope. And what I would say, you still think there's hope that you can save yourself. You hid in that ditch because you still think there's hope in saving yourself. The only hope, he continues, the only hope you have is to accept the fact that you're already dead. The sooner you accept that, the sooner you'll be able to function as a soldier is supposed to function. And he concludes, all war depends upon it. 
This is exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying in Colossians chapter 3. It's what he's saying in this Philippians passage. In Colossians chapter 3, he summarizes it as clearly as we possibly can. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, if this is the true reality, right? Seek the things that are above where Christ is. Look there. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are of the earth. So, so don't set your mind on, on the stock market. Yeah, it's crashing. It's scary. Don't set your mind there. Set your things on the things. That, don't set your mind on the number of people that have been tested or the people that have died. Don't set your mind there. Doesn't mean it's not there. It's not present. But set your mind on the things that are above and then listen to verse three. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Loved ones, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. It cannot be lost. It cannot be lost. And, and the sooner and the truer that we allow to absorb that, and that becomes the foundation, the bottom, the bedrock of our lives, are we going to be able to move through this season with courage and confidence, with love and hope, not getting meshed into the small things, but rising up and being a force for good in the midst of a broken generation. That is the invitation God has for us. And so the rehearsal of our hearts and mind comes back to the question one of our catechism, which is a great thing to rehearse right now. The answer to question one of our catechism, what is our only hope in life and death? What is the bedrock? That we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and in death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the ground. And so this morning as we come and we have an opportunity to be reminded of this by coming to the table, by taking these elements and being reminded that the ground that we belong to Christ, that is the truest thing. And so as you serve one another, remind each other, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are not your own. You belong to him. And it is therefore well with your soul. Let's pray. Father, we must have grounding during these days and our only solid ground is you. Your love and your grace and the surety that not only do we get you, but we have you and that in life and death, there is nothing to fear because you are the one. And so we receive you today through these elements into our body, the body of Christ broken and his blood shed for us to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ, our savior. All God's people said, amen. Serve one another the elements at this time. Well, receive the benediction from the first part of Philippians chapter 1. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with all the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory of God the Father. Friends, Brothers, sisters, you are loved. Grace and peace to you. Um, we miss seeing you face to face, but stay connected online. I'm sure we'll get to see you later online this week and back next Sunday on this channel. Have a good week.